Hi, this is Matthew Bird here to talk to you about the life and work of Josiah Wedgwood. There's a lot that industrial designers can learn by looking at his work. He was one of the first people to combine manufacturing with design, a healthy dose of material integrity and material investigation, understanding the user, marketing, all sorts of things that we do as designers are evident in his work in the 18th century. And it's remarkable to see how little has changed about a lot of the ways he introduced thinking about design and manufacturing. I'm going to enjoy some tea made in my Wedgwood Black Basalt teapot. A careful observer will have noticed that the little hole in the finial focuses the steam and makes a sort of genie in a bottle effect. So if you aren't lucky enough to have the same teapot, just make any old tea and sit back and enjoy an overview of Josiah Wedgwood. Mm. Examining Josiah Wedgwood and his work and his approach to work can be really instructive for designers. Long after his death in 1863, William Gladstone wrote about him, he was the greatest man who ever, in any age or in any country, applied himself to the important work of uniting art with industry. He's one of the first people I could point to who understood the contributions that art can make to industry and the contributions that industry could make to art. By combining manufacturing and marketing and an understanding of the user and a little bit of psychology and a whole huge dose of material integrity and investigation, he arrived at a better form of ceramic manufacturing with better materials and as a result better output. So looking at how he achieved that can teach us a lot about how we might re-examine how we do things today. When Josiah Wedgwood looked around at other pottery that was being made when he was starting his professional career, he found it to be sort of lacking, and I think you can see why. Although for their day these were very sophisticated teapots, the teapot on the left is sort of pumpkinish shaped with a smeary sort of glaze. That's because the glazes that they could make were unreliable. The minerals that were included in them produced strange colors, so they turned the volume knob on that up and made strange colors on purpose, and their ability to mold ceramics was relatively limited. And the piece on the right is much more sophisticated in that it's hand-painted enamel, so they're putting color in an intentional way on this teapot, but it's still relatively crude to our eyes, and also to Wedgwood's eyes. It's instructive to look at other pieces that were around at the time, because it tells us a lot about where ceramics manufacturing was. When coffee drinking was new, People realized that coffee pots needed to be tall, so you stir the hot water in the coffee grounds, let the coffee grounds settle, and then when you pour, the spout takes the coffee from slightly above the level of the settled coffee grounds. That's a classic coffee pot shape on the left, made in sterling silver. On the right, in an effort to make a less expensive version for more people to be able to afford, is a ceramic version, made by Wielden, who became Wedgwood's partner. And I think when you look at it, you can see it's not a triumph of form because it's understanding ceramics. It's a form that's suggesting it's the same thing as that silver version that you know but can't afford. And the decoration on it is sort of maybe vaguely Chinese or vaguely Dutch, uh, and it uses a little dab of color here and there, but it's not a very careful application. You will laugh at me when I say that this is an improvement, but what Wedgwood and Wielden realized is that if you purify the clay body, if you really work on getting that clay body to be a pure, more even consistency, and as a result also a purer color, you can do a couple of things. You could put a clear glaze on it and not have to hide it under a smeary glaze, and you could mold a much more careful surface decoration into it. So unfortunately, if you're doing a careful material investigation and you realize that this new purified clay that Wedgwood worked on could hold a texture nicely, was moldable, and could hold a clear glaze, you end up, of course, with cauliflower. It's the only logical result. The green glaze doesn't need to be smears of different colors. It's hiding its imperfections in the texture of the leaves and as a result making them look even more leaf-like. So here's coffee pot and teapot in crazy cauliflower pattern, not because people craved cauliflower at the time, but because it made sense as a material investigation. Very quickly, that led to a whole new approach to making ceramics for Wedgwood. If the clay body is very pure and can stay white and get a clear glaze over it, you could actually apply enamel or paint to it 
before glazing and have a whole new range of decorative scheme. The piece on the left is a tureen made in this white ceramic and then painted with a landscape scene. And the piece on the right, enameled by David Rhodes, you might look at that and say, that's still pretty crude. But look at the amount of control that Rhodes was able to execute in applying the color because the material he's painting on is so much more pure. The improved clay body and its pure white color without needing a colored glaze to hide the imperfections of the surface also provided a very smooth, very even canvas for transfer printing. This is a technique that existed before Wedgwood came along, but he produced a clay body so able to take advantage of this technology that it really took off. Uh, this is a technique where a, an engraved copper plate that might be used for printing newspapers or books the same thing happens, but you print onto a piece of paper and then transfer the ink onto the ceramic from that paper and glaze over it. So compare this to the smeary pumpkin teapot. You almost can't. It's so much more sophisticated in its decorative scheme. You could get a really detailed engraving of pheasants or a woman in nature with scales in her hand. I'm not certain who she is, but she's lovely, isn't she? And that's all a result of being able to apply new technologies to transfer images onto ceramics because the material being used was so much better. Wedgwood capitalized on this very quickly and in lots of really smart ways. First of all, he realized it's foolish to produce a lot of ceramics and send it out in the world and hope for the best, hope you can sell it. It makes more sense to take orders, to send out samples with a salesperson, collect orders, and then satisfy those orders. And he could exponentially increase the range of things he offered by doing this. So on the left is a tureen and a serving bowl of some kind made in this white ceramic body, hand-painted or transfer-painted with different borders. And you can see if you make the actual form plain enough and rely for its decorative success on the hand-painting, you have endless amount of variety. You could produce one bowl, a hundred different patterns, and you actually have a hundred different bowls to sell. This is very smart business plan. This work was so bold and so new-looking that even though it was comparatively inexpensive, it caught the attention of Queen Charlotte. In 1766, Wedgwood was appointed potter to Her Majesty and renamed this clay body Queensware. Really what happened was Queen Charlotte said, that stuff's pretty, I'd like some. And Wedgwood, being the smart marketing person he was, said, sure, I would love to sell you some. May I reference you in the rest of my selling of this stuff? So this became Queensware, and imagine... It sounds like a small advance, but imagine you're sitting at home with your little Wedgwood teapot with a lovely border, and you've invited friends over, and they admire your teapot, and you say, oh, yes, this? Yes, Queen Charlotte has the same one. It's a remarkable leveling of, or elevating, of status as a result of a very simple decorative technique. Wedgwood didn't rest on Queensware. He went on to continue investigating how he could improve the clay bodies to get better and better variety and success using clay. Remember that clay is essentially just dirt and water. It's mud that is carefully handled and processed and fired to remove the water. And in the process, it can vitrify to a certain extent. Wedgwood played with the different components, the different firing temperatures, and his ability to make the ceramic vitrify turn more and more glass-like in its structure. This is a clay body he made called basalt. And I love that because basalt really is volcanic rock. Is this volcanic rock? No, it's dirt. But by calling it basalt, he's claiming references to some of nature's finest, hardest, most beautiful substances. And it's actually a black stoneware that fires at very high temperature and vitrifies and is polishable. You can polish the surface. As a result, it doesn't need to be glazed to hold water or to attain a shiny surface. So that's a radical new aesthetic that he can create by carefully examining the materials he's using, this beautiful unglazed black clay body. And we arrive through ever more trials at what becomes the defining look of Wedgwood ceramics. This is jasper ware, again named for something in nature, jasper, which is a kind of quartz. This isn't made of quartz, it's just dirt. But by calling it jasper ware, you're making associations to all sorts of unattainable, wonderful materials. And it's actually a relatively simple technique. Barium sulfate is added to the stoneware, and that gives it this blue color. The blue color is molded, and then the white clay is molded in plaster molds and applied over the blue, and it's fired and becomes one unit. 
it's a really, when done well, a remarkable aesthetic. And again, it's the result of careful material exploration. What's interesting too is, it's a very simple addition. He added barium sulfate, but at the time there wasn't patent protection really. There wasn't a way to keep this trade secret. So what Wedgwood did was have the barium sulfate shipped to London, where it was ground into a powder by people who didn't know what it was or why they were doing what they were doing to it. They packaged it and sent it to Staffordshire, where his employees unpacked it, didn't really know what it was, were given the specialized task of mixing the clay body. So he broke the chain of information, and as a result, it was unclear how this was produced. In fact, it was relatively simple, and that helped keep this Wedgwood secret for a long time. This slide helps explain how this technique is accomplished. At the bottom, you can see a blue bowl and white figures being applied, dancing around the border. On the top, you can see those figures being cleaned up a little bit, and on the right, actually made by being pressed into plaster molds. After the clay is pressed into the molds and the plaster absorbs enough of the moisture, the clay is tapped out of the molds and then transferred onto the bowl. You can also see in this slide the division of labor that was employed in Wedgwood's factory. So one person who was more adept at filling the molds and knowing when to tap them out without damaging the contents would do that all day long. And next to her is sitting someone who is a little more careful at attaching the figures onto the vessel so the pieces would work their way down the line until they were finished. Wedgwood realized that this technique of molding two colors of ceramic could open all sorts of other doors into his interests, and that's the reason I love looking at Wedgwood. He was unable to separate what he was interested in from what he was working on professionally. He was friends with the Duke of Portland, and the Duke of Portland had acquired the Barberini vase, which is a Roman cameo cut glass vase. It's a incredibly difficult technique. A black vase was blown out of glass and then a layer of white glass was applied over that and then by hand it's carved away. The white glass is carved away until you get back to the black and that creates this two color effect. I have no idea how they did that in 50 AD. I doubt we could do it today. It's a remarkably sophisticated thing and when Wedgwood saw it at the Duke of Portland's house he said hey I would like to replicate that with this two color clay approach I'm working on. May I borrow it? And for some reason, the Duke of Portland said, sure. So for four years, Wedgwood pursued producing a copy of the Portland vase. On the left is the original made in glass, and on the right is Wedgwood's ceramic version. Certainly there are differences because clay does different things than glass, but it has no business looking as like the original as it does because it's a completely different material. And it will always be true that materials do things their own way and you can't force them to do things in another way. And yet Wedgwood got so remarkably close. He finished it in 1790 after four years of work. It went on exhibit in London and was so popular that visitors had to be restricted. One reason it was this popular is there was growing interest in antiquity. People were realizing that the times they lived in were not uh, isolated from history, but a continuation of history. And all sorts of beginnings of archaeology were happening in the world. Of course, if you were the Duke of Portland, you could purchase the original. If you weren't, you didn't have access. We didn't have such good museums at the time. So you can imagine if you lived in a world where you heard about this modern marvel of technology that allowed reproduction of ancient Roman secrets, it would be very exciting. Here's the other side of the vase where you can see how incredibly effective the two colors of clay and how transparent they can become in firing are at mimicking the glass original. So this jasperware, this ability to make two colors of ceramic do something decorative, becomes the foundation for the Wedgwood Empire for the next 200 years. On the left is a small picture from 1790 in the RISD Museum's collection, and on the right is almost the same picture from perhaps the 1920s from my cupboard and I bought it for five dollars because at the time it had a broken spout and if you look carefully you'll see that I sort of fixed it. But what's remarkable to me is all those years later the form is almost exactly the same. The decorative effect, although perhaps a little less sophisticated, a little more clumsy, is essentially the same. And that's a remarkable lifespan for one technology and one product. I'd like to talk a little bit about what makes Wedgwood a great man, because certainly he was a great potter, he was a great businessman, but he also used what he cared about to fuel his investigations in life, and that's ultimately one of the best examples you could ever look to in trying to figure out how to live your own lives. At the time when Wedgwood was working, 
There were all sorts of challenges to a business person and to a potter. I'd like to go through a few of those and talk about how Wedgwood conquered them. This is what roads looked like. Roads at the time were maintained by the church or by municipalities. So if you were in a town, you might have nice roads, but good luck getting from town to town. And even at their best, roads in springtime, when things turned to mud, would be difficult to get around. We solved that problem by installing turnpikes. A turnpike is a road that you pay to get on, and the lower left shows a turnpike where a carriage has arrived and is paying a fee to the cloaked figure of death in the corner. I don't know who that is, but that figure, once the payment is received, lifts the pike and lets you go through onto the road. So that provided a more consistent road. But imagine you make ceramics and you've got to load up a cart and send it out in the world with your ceramics. There's a pretty good chance it either won't get there or will get broken on the way if this is the best method of delivery you have. What we see starting in 1766 is the beginning of a movement to make natural waterways connected with man-made waterways so that distribution networks can happen in barges. And Wedgwood's right in at the beginning of this. He, only in his 30s at the time, becomes the treasurer for the project, which is completed in 1777. So it's an 11-year project to get a bunch of shovels and dig a whole lot of trenches. And by the 1820s, there's a complete national network in England of waterways. The picture on the left shows the natural waterways, the picture on the right, some of the methods of connecting them. Here's a picture of what those barges look like and what the waterways look like, so you can get a sense of how effective this would be. The path next to the waterways for the horse or the mule to pull the barge. A healthy horse could pull a cart with two tons in it. That same horse could pull a river barge with 100 tons in it. The transportation costs are reduced from 10 cents to one and a half cents per ton per mile. That's an unbelievable savings, but add on to that the idea that you have essentially no breakage. There are no bumps in this road. So if you pack your things well, they'll all get there. That's a remarkable step forward for manufacturing. The system had over 93 miles, 75 locks to negotiate changes in altitude, and at one point a 3,000 yard tunnel, which you couldn't pay me to go through. Here's an engraving of the Etruria factory, again a name that suggests antiquity, but is made up just to describe the new factory that Wedgwood had purpose-built for his pottery. Most manufacturing locations, his included, before this was built, were a series of smaller buildings uh, where people just sort of spread from one to another. Wedgwood realized that by building a new building, he could actually have the building support the manufacturing process. But what do you see when you look at this picture? The factory in the, in the middle ground with a bell tower, because it was not one of the earliest factories to have a bell instead of just someone blowing a horn to call the workers in. But really what you see is the canal. Because if you were a manufacturer, you'd have to cart your stuff to the dock to get it onto a barge. But if you were the treasurer of the canal commission, you might make certain that the canal went right in front of your factory. So Wedgwood could actually load barges right in his factory. This factory also was one of the very first to have steam power installed in 1782. Wedgwood had a pretty sophisticated moral compass that was of his own devising. And although the abolition movement had no reason to really exist in Staffordshire, he believed in it very firmly. And he realized, I don't believe in slavery, and I make stuff out of clay. Those two things could come together somehow. Wedgwood produced thousands of these medallions for the Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade in 1787. And he sent them all around. He sent Ben Franklin hundreds of them to distribute in America, and he distributed them all free. That, to me, is such a powerful statement. I can make stuff, and I should use that power to make profit, but also to support my interests and help make the world a better place. Am I not a man and a brother? Wedgwood was also very interested in science and was sort of forced to be interested in science by the world that he found himself functioning in. Up until this point, the best method you had for understanding the temperature of your kiln was your kiln operator just had a lot of experience and could look in the kiln and by the color of the fire decide it needed more fuel or less fuel or more oxygen or less oxygen and make adjustments. But you can imagine that's a pretty unscientific approach. If you overfire or underfire, the contents are, of your kiln are ruined. They might get destroyed, they might not be fired and be strong enough. So the temperature of the kiln and the duration of the fire are very important and yet for centuries it was just based on experience and luck. 
Wedgwood realized that if there were a scientific way to measure the temperature in a kiln, you'd have better success. And this is the pyrometer that he arrived at. The clay slugs are put in the kiln. They're of a standard fixed size in a clay body that expands and contracts in an understandable way. And then there's a brass sheet with tapered grooves. So you take a slug out of the kiln and slide it down until it stops, and that tells you the temperature of the kiln. This is still not a thermometer because it's not actually telling you the temperature, but it's giving a more regular understanding of the temperature in the kiln. That incredibly reduced breakage at the Wedgwood factories. Wedgwood also realized that his creamware produced useful scientific vessels. There are still people who say that a Wedgwood mortar and pestle in a special clay he made that's a higher fire called mortarware are the best ones you can get. And he distributed those at first free to scientists and to chemists. He made retorts and tubes and pans and mortars and pestles. At a certain point he had to start charging for them because so many people wanted them. Yeah, I'm a scientist. Give me one of those, free. This slide shows two trays from the Wedgwood Museum. Wedgwood constantly experimented and perfected his clay bodies and recorded everything he did. Over the course of his 40 years in business, he produced more than 10,000 trials, all recorded. On the left, you can see experimenting with Jasperware. How much barium sulfate do I put in to get the right color blue? When I put too much in, how does that affect the clay body? Could I tip into grays or into greens by changing the chemistry? He produced over 3,000 trials just to get Jasperware correct. That's an incredible tenacity that I think is hard to imagine in our days of just Google it and copy someone else. It was sheer determination and drive that produced all of the innovations that Wedgwood introduced. And here are two images of the Etruria factory from later, from 1930, but it was built in 1769. On the top, you can see that the whole campus of this factory was considered as a machine, not just for producing ceramics, but for supporting the activities that happened there. There were 290 workers, and the campus included 100 houses for those workers. It also had two manor houses for Wedgwood and his business partner, and a lake and park. So the quality of life of the workers, for this time especially, was a consideration that Wedgwood thought about. And the factory, as I mentioned, supports the idea of division of labor. So for the first time ever, really, the grinding room where stone is ground into a powder to make clay bodies is separate from the rest of the factory. So the people doing the grinding probably still end up with silica lung disease, but the rest of the workers don't. The dangerous things can be kept contained. The kiln, the fire can be in a separate building in case there's a problem there. And then the building is arranged in a logical way so that as the clay is made, it, it works its way through the building and turns into finished goods. That idea of purpose-built factory architecture is something the world will figure out very quickly after, but Wedgwood's Etruria is one of the first places to really use architecture to support manufacturing. At first, Wedgwood's factories were man-powered. In this picture, you can see on the left a man turning the wheel whose motion is transferred to the potter's wheel. The potter's wheel also goes up and down so that you can work on big things or small things, so that you could have a tall or short person working on it. That was a, a Wedgwood introduction. When Wedgwood went on a tour of Matthew Bolton's factory and saw a watt rotative steam engine in action, he realized that he could power his factory with that. And as early as 1782, which is incredibly early, he used steam power at Etruria to grind flint, to mix clay bodies, right at the power source. That steam engine was still working in 1912, so that was a pretty good investment. This slide shows a film from the Wedgwood Museum, and it helps give you a sense of the scale of this operation. The men are loading what are called sagers. Those are large ceramic containers that can be stacked in the kiln. That allows for compartmentalization, so you can stack plates in one, you could put teapots in another, you could put cups in another, and you don't have to worry about something in the kiln shifting and everything collapsing. These are very stable containers and that allows the instability of a teapot or a teacup on the inside to have less effect on the overall health of the firing. You'll see in this video that as the sagers are filled, they're carried into the kiln. That's not a job I would want because I couldn't balance anything on my head, but these men are so adept at it that they not only walk through the factory with sagers on their head, but walk up the ladder into the kiln and stack them in this enormous, enormous kiln. 
Wedgwood also introduced some other techniques for consistency's sake. The idea of using jigs and dods for making plates that were all the same. The idea of using clay extruders to make different profiles. The idea of inspections. If you're making a teapot and one person is molding the spout, another person is molding the body, there are a certain number of fixed holes through the body into the spout and that filters the tea leaves out. Those connections are very important. Those details matter. If you wait till the entire teapot is done to inspect that and there's a problem, you've lost all of that labor and all of those supplies. If you inspect the parts along the way, you can identify problems as they're happening. He also introduced the idea of the time clock where workers would have to mark off their arrival and departure. Because the canal went right in front of Etruria and there was a water source, that also allowed fire engines. That's a fire engine from 1783, which I think is remarkable. Also, if you have lots of people turning shapes on a wheel and you want them to be consistent, you can use profiling tools so people can turn the vessel and push the profiling tool against it to make sure that it has exactly the right shape. And a rouletting tool can be pressed against something on the wheel to produce an incised pattern. There were all sorts of technical advances being tested out and implemented at the Etruria. There's embracing of technology on sort of every scale, from the steam engine to the smallest rouletting wheels. This picture is from the 1950s, thus the horn-rimmed glasses, but it shows an engine turning lathe that Wedgwood purchased in 1763. An engine turning lathe is made for watchmaking because it turns something in fixed increments. And if you're making a gear, you can turn it, cut the gear, turn it, cut the gear, and you get even spacing of teeth on your gear. Wedgwood realized you could put greenware, which is dried but not yet fired ceramics, on this engine turning device and use it to create patterns. These two engine turning lathes that he bought were in operation all the way through the 1950s. If you showed me these objects and offered them to me, I'd probably say, no thanks. They're not really my cup of tea, but I love them as material investigations because they show this truth that when an artist or a designer gets a new tool, a new kind of form language can occur. A door opens into a new way of thinking about form. And these are objects that were made with the engine turning lathe with an eccentric chuck movement and some sort of profiling tool pressed into the clay. So as the object turns and moves back and forth, the incised patterns follow that movement. And you get this incredible texture that is at once irrational and very regular. That's a result of technology. Wedgwood was adept at understanding market, understanding his users and their needs, and making objects that spoke to those needs. That's something that industrial designers do now. It's part of what we have to do, but it wasn't always the case. And I love that as early as 1790, Wedgwood was looking for ways to combine what he knew how to do with what the world needed. In the 1790s, there were grain shortages, and people couldn't get flour to make pastry. So you can't have a meat pie without the crust. Wedgwood realized that his high-fire stoneware that didn't need a glaze on it, this particular body he called caneware, looked a lot like pastry and could be molded to look even more like pastry. So you could buy this item, fill it with the contents of your pie, bake it, and serve it to your family. Sorry, we have no actual pastry, but we'll still get your brain thinking that you've had it. I think they're remarkably beautiful objects, and they come out of this marriage of technical ability and user need. In the first 12 months, Wedgwood sold over 4,000 of these game pie dishes. That tells you how well he connected his technical manufacturing abilities with user need. I also like that there is no particular Wedgwood style. There are materials that produce a recognizable sort of blue and white, but Wedgwood was careful to work in almost every kind of style all the way through his career if you showed me a picture of the vase on the left, my brain would say that's 1920s. That's so modern and pure in its form, and yet it's 1790. From probably around the same time period is the tureen on the right, which has that smeary glaze on some oyster-ish shape. I'm not especially fond of it, but it's so radically different than the piece on the left, and yet they're from the same factory in the same time period, and that's a remarkable difference of style. This is a black basalt hedgehog bulb pot. Is it the first chia pet? Perhaps. You plant your bulbs inside and when they grow they look like the hedgehog spikes. So Wedgwood's also looking for different scale of things that can be manufactured using the clay. 
It is true that none of us likes to do our bookkeeping, but it's a part of design that's required to really do design well, and Wedgwood realized that very early. These are his cost accounting journals. How much did the clay cost? How much did the fuel for firing the clay cost? How much did the labor cost? How much did the shipping cost? Not just for a batch or a year or a month or a day or an hour, but per piece. This teacup cost how much? If you figure that out, and it's quite complicated to figure out, then you know how much profit you can make. And what Wedgwood realized was that perceived value and actual cost have a relationship that leads to your ability to control profit. So sometimes you might lose money selling something, but it gets you esteem or notoriety of some kind. Sometimes you can make vast amounts of money on something if you really control that balance. If you understand which things you make more money on, you can make more of those things and pursue the profit in an intentional way. So cost accounting was a big part of what Wedgwood did in his business. He also, as I mentioned before, realized that you could send salesmen out with a catalog of different forms, with a sample, in this case only half a sample, of an object to show you texture and pattern and give you a sense of what it will look like, and people could take orders. And there are all sorts of efficiencies in that. You can have one catalog page that shows form, you could have one that shows decorative motif, you could have samples to show glazes, and you have as a result of the equation involved, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things that you can sell to people. And then all you have to do is manufacture to satisfy those orders and send the pieces out. It's a much lower risk way to sell things. Wedgwood was also not only interested in, but able to move quickly to address different trends and styles and interests at the time. Because clay is essentially just molded, fired dirt, it's very easy to adapt to different aesthetic styles and forms with clay, and Wedgwood realized that being light on his feet with different styles would allow him more customers, more form, more variety. When Napoleon's armies conquered Egypt, there were artists with them recording what Egypt looked like. When those engravings made their way back through Europe and through England, people became extremely interested in the Egyptian style, and Wedgwood realized that this was a perfect style for the material innovations he had introduced. He could use the red body, which was called Rosso Antico, and mold black over that or white over that and stick an alligator on top and suddenly you've got an Egyptian teapot, which is essentially almost exactly the same form as the other teapots you are already making. Because Wedgwood was interested in archaeology and in ancient history, he also worked very hard to sort of rediscover how Greek ceramics were made. As people began to look at Greek pottery, we realized that the black and tan effect was technically extremely difficult and lost. Wedgwood reinvented methods with his black basalt of creating that aesthetic. So again, you might not be able to afford a real Greek urn, there might not be many available, but you could buy a Wedgwood replication or simulation of an actual Greek vase. Wedgwood was also interested in reviving forms from ancient Greece. There were a lot of shapes that were being discovered through archaeology that had been forgotten, and Wedgwood was interested in reproducing those. What we arrive at when you look at these larger presentation pieces that Wedgwood made is a really bold statement of British national style. What I like is that most people looking at this would say, oh, it's Adams-esque. It looks so appropriate in an Adams architectural interior. There are lots of different ways you could describe this and be correct. But to my eye, they're triumphs of manufacturing and material investigation. On the left is a creamware ewer that celebrates the fact that, that Wedgwood had arrived at a mottled glaze that looked like stone and a metallic glaze that looked like gilded bronze. Those two glazes allowed a very humble creamware to be turned into something that looks incredibly precious. And the other two pieces celebrate this technology of molding different colors of jasper ware to get something that looks unlike anything that really could be produced any other way. So this British national style is very much a result of careful material investigation and smart manufacturing. By the end of his career, Wedgwood had transformed both what was possible in ceramics manufacturing and what the world came to expect from ceramics. His investigative 
and engaged nature led to innovations and advances and new ways of thinking about manufacturing and selling and using and even coveting objects, which are still evident today. We still want the teapot that the king uses. He died in 1795 at the age of 65 and left a fortune. He left 30,000 pounds to each of his sons and 25,000 pounds to each of his daughters, which at the time was an unusual practice. His total estate was worth over 500,000 pounds, which is over $80 million in today's dollars. So very successful for a humble potter making stuff out of dirt. He had eight children, six of whom survived him. You'll be interested to know that his daughter Suki was the mother of Charles Darwin, so he is Charles Darwin's grandfather. His son John was one of the founders of the Royal Horticultural Society, one of the world's first horticultural societies based on the premise that we can learn from nature, which is a pretty radical idea still. And his son Josiah inherited the pottery and kept it running. His son Thomas was one of the early inventors of photography who investigated using silver salts and silver nitrate on leather to record the impressions of light. It wasn't fixable, so it wasn't permanent lasting photography, but at the very dawn of photography, Thomas Wedgwood was working on that. So this is not a family to be taken lightly. And all of that, I think, is the result of, of growing up with this incredible man at the head of the family who proved that passion and determination and savvy can leave a legacy that hundreds of years later still inspire us and have things to teach us.